I remember as a student, uh, marijuana was, was on, starting to come on campus. Uh, I would go into a couple, you know, fraternity or sorority parties, and I'm, I was talk about naive. I mean, I was out to lunch. I'd walk in, and I'd say, geez, what, what's that smell? And I had, it was not so pervasive that it was a, a, a common part of the culture. I didn't even know what it, what it was. But increasingly, it became more and more used. In the left, this was, you know, pot was almost sort of a, a god, you know. Conservatives thought that was ridiculous. Now, I'm sure there are some conservatives now that smoke or whatever, but we felt that, that pot and drugs are debilitating, it's dangerous. Uh, you know, life is a wonderful high. What, what do you have to, you know, do that sort of thing for? And we also felt that, uh, maybe uh, seeing a conspiracy here where, where there was none, but that if you have a society that where the culture thinks it's acceptable to get high on drugs, again, this abandonment of individual responsibility, of being responsible for what you do, uh, that that, again, if that took hold, that would have a, a, a disastrous effect on our country. Well, that's exactly what's happened. I was, I was just appalled. I mean, why? What's the, what a waste. The tragedy is the left is part of their agenda, although there's some on the libertarian side of the conservative movement say you ought to legalize pot and Bill Buckley does and so on. That's a debate within our movement. But generally, the left was as a, as a group very, that was part of their agenda, part of their look, part of their culture, was that drugs were great. Conservatives, particularly young people, said absolutely not. You've been listening to Emmy. She's a lifelong political and social conservative, and this was recorded in 1989. I'm David Hoffman, filmmaker. I did that interview back in 89 when she was talking about 1964 when she entered the University of Michigan as a freshman. Now, this is one of 200 interviews that my team and I did as part of a series we made on the 1960s in 1989. So people were looking back 20, 25 years. And we tried to get all political opinions, all social experiences. And I really wanted to give everyone the chance to put it their own way, to say what they experienced and what they saw. You've probably seen other of my interviews, but this interview with Emmy, I consider special because she really lays it out for how she felt as a student in a very tense time in the colleges of America, where she was on one side and most of the noise was on the other side. Stick with it because Emmy shares the conservative point of view at that time. And you'll find that very interesting in terms of today's political partisan divide. What I saw was that there was a lot of liberal leftist activity on, on the campus. People who were uh, uh, articulate, bright, um, and very dedicated, and very hardworking on their political agenda. In fact, there was some, I, I can't name names or anything, but it, there was a sense that there were a lot of these students on there who were almost like paid activists. That, that, and I'm talking about the University of Michigan. I don't, I don't know about other schools. But it was partly in reaction, my reaction to that, that uh, you'd go across campus and there'd be political booths all over the place for, um, uh, promoting, you know, socialist causes and, and also civil rights. Uh, I think conservatives might have been more involved in the civil rights movement had it not appeared to some of us at the outset that it was being manipulated and, and uh, uh, maneuvered by some hardcore liberal leftist activists. The young Republicans at the University of Michigan were sort of a reflection of the National Party, in my view, then, sort of the me too Republicans. Uh, you know, Democrats outnumber us, we're never going to win, so we might as well sound like Democrats, just say we can do what they can do better. That was not appealing to me. And in the face of all this activism at the University of Michigan, I was saying, where are the organizations and the individuals who can, with passion and conviction, articulate a conservative fundamental philosophy and, and carry this message? So I was always on the lookout for things of that sort, uh, even after I got involved in the College Young Republicans. And there was a uh, fellow who came to speak at the University of Michigan at the Student Union. 
I remember sitting uh, sitting in the audience, and uh, I, w I was very excited about it because uh, here was somebody speaking about ideas, values, concepts um, that I firmly believed in, and uh, and also felt were were right and good. And so I went up to him after the meeting, and uh, even then, I suppose as a as a conservative, we were somewhat. Uh, you learned to question authority, but I was also, you know, impressed with he was the state chairman of Young Americans Freedom, and uh, he was nice looking too. So I went up to him afterwards and introduced myself, and uh, told him I was a student there, and I said, George, this is, you know, or Mr. McDonald probably addressed him as Mr. McDonald, and I said I'd be very interested in getting involved. I'm I'm secretary of the college Young Republicans here at U of M, and uh, you know it's driving me crazy because they're not you know, doing much. And uh, so he followed up, contacted me, and then I got very active in YAF. NSA was very powerful nationally as a student organization. Their agenda was to condense it, sort of one-worldism, very pro-UN, uh, sort of generally let's accommodate and appease the communists. You know, the worst thing in the world is the Cold War, not the worst thing in the world is to lose your freedom. But the worst thing in the world is the Cold War. So, so they had a whole different agenda. Every university or college had to join. The students were required. It's like compulsory unionism. You had to pay dues, irrespective of whether or not their, their, their agenda, and their agenda was very clear, was different from your own, which I thought was absolutely outrageous. Doesn't say much for academic freedom, does it? We worked as one of our you know, projects to bring that to the attention of the students on campus and to get the university administration to release the students from having to pay compulsory dues to be a member of this national student organization. So that, that was sort of one little project at the University of Michigan. Uh, to use a 60s sort of liberal phrase, it was a consciousness raising, <laughs> you know, uh, activism. What percentage of your time did you spend at this kind of activity? I mean, are you talking about more of your time than any more, more more in a time than I should have, and and my grades showed it, and my parents were not very happy about that. But if I'd been, you know, um, having poor grades because I was staying up all night and partying or whatever, that would be different. But I guess underneath it all, although they were concerned at the time that my grades were slipping, um, I suspect that they felt well. It's all in a good cause, and I was learning so much that the stimulation of the debate. We would get into debates or shouting matches. You know, as we there's an area at the University of Michigan, sort of a central area where all the um, the kids walk through the center of campus, campus called the diag, the diagonal, and we would have tables set up there trying to recruit members into YAF or College of Repu Young Republicans. Describe yourself. How the conservatives were treated by the, the, the activists left and liberals. Which well, I can also tell you how they were treated by the academics, by the professors. Tell me about that. The oh, feeling of being a conservative. That, because it's always spoken about, as you say, the activist left is always implying in the early 60s how hard it was. Oh, baloney. I mean, they had, I think a lot of that's baloney. Heck, they, at, at, they could close down Columbia University. They, they, they bombed, firebombed the University of Wisconsin laboratory. And the professors, and the administrators sat on their hands. Um, they did nothing. They were cowed by these by these kids, students. I mean, those weren't activists. Though those you know those were destroyers. Uh, uh, my recollection, and it's a. I'm glad you asked me this. I I can't remember the teacher's name, and it's lucky for him. I remember very clearly. Uh, mocked me, laughed at me. Uh, it, really, in in class. I mean, I didn't. I mean, I didn't take any of that personally. What what it what angered and alarmed me. Those are my words. It angered and alarmed me to sit in a classroom at a university that has one of the finest uh, liberal arts schools in the country, and to in essence listen to this propaganda. And I'm going to say one thing briefly. I remember very clearly Bill Buckley's line about describing the liberal's definition of academic freedom. And what he said I experienced in that classroom at the University of Michigan. He said the liberal's idea of academic freedom is to expose the student to everything from Galbraith to Schlesinger. 
and and he's absolutely right. I I asked the professor, what, why aren't we studying, or why aren't you talking about the works of of Friedrich Hayek, who later won the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Ludwig von Mises, um, Ortega y Gasset, uh, you know, philosophers. Uh, why are we talking all about? Marxist Leninism as if this is the the panacea for for the problems of our age. You are not exposing us to these other thoughts. The idea of academic freedom, I did not experience that in a narrow sense in that classroom. Did you experience it as a religious class distinction between liberals and conservatives? You're asking a good question. That's an excellent question because do you know where I had the greatest exposure to people that were different from my own uh, background. And again, I grew up not thinking about my social, economic, or ethnic background. I mean, it's ridiculous. I thought of myself as an individual, uh, part of a family. But we weren't stereotyping ourselves then, as, as everybody seems compelled to do it now. But the way I met a lot of people from a wide range of backgrounds was through my political activism. Most, in fact, I never really knew very many so-called blue-collar families. I came from a middle-class neighborhood of professionals and, and business people, some professors and so on. But it was not a community where there were a lot of people that, you know, Joe Lunchpail went off to work at the factory or whatever. I came in contact with the sons and daughters of immigrants from Eastern Europe, uh, from Latin America, um, Jews, uh, very few blacks, unfortunately, in Detroit. You know, we—that's another area. That—that—that's one of the big failings of of uh, of conservatives, and we can talk about that later. But that—that's where I really got to know people from a very different background, and their families. Some of them weren't very well educated. Some didn't even have high school diplomas, but they had that common sense. They knew. They didn't get all tangled up in their, their thinking. It was sort of straight line thinking based on a lot of good old common sense and experience and looking at history. And, uh, and their children reflected that. And they, the, the children were very, I mean, my, my peers were, were very active with us. So it was a, a melting pot. How did you or do you feel about Woodstock? What is your feeling about Woodstock? Does that, how does that mean? I'm just, I'm glad I wasn't there. Such a mess. Oy, I mean, it's, I'm glad I wasn't there. I mean, it just does not sound fun. You know, everybody smoking dope and, and slogging around in the mud. It, it did not sound fun. A lot of exhibitionism, I guess, was sort of my reaction to it. Hippies. Self-indulgent, um, self-absorbed. Uh, they, they would always talk about their love of humanity, and yet you, looking at appearances, and that's what they wanted us to do, isn't it? I mean, they dressed in a way that would draw attention and so on. Although it was, they didn't want us to base impressions on appearances. So it was, wasn't quite sure what their point was. But here they talk about a great, you know, concern about mankind. I mean, these all vague generalizations, and yet in their own appearance, conduct, um, their own uh, uh, hygiene, uh, you know, betray sort of a lack of, of self-respect. And if you don't have a self-respect, it's hard to respect others. The women's movement. I think they, they, they confused a whole generation of women by a, a lot of the a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the activist stuff, making them feel that it was wrong to be married and have children. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. Nominating Goldwater. We did not uh, mythologize Goldwater. Uh, he was not, you know, godlike or whatever. He was the articulator, the standard bearer of ideas and ideals that was the focus of our commitment and passion. And we were just lucky to have somebody who was also charming and personable and, and uh, uh, dynamic. The threats felt by yourself and other people like you, the threats to America. Yeah, I, I saw it in a number, a number of ways. I saw it domestically in terms of the federal 
government's role in our lives, my parents' lives, individual lives, was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That the dominant philosophy of government is the solution to all problems. And in the process, um, individuals could relinquish their own responsibility was having psychologically, if you will, uh, a, a slow but very clear debilitating effect on the country. You could see it in education where standards were being uh, allowed to, to collapse on what was required in school. You could see it in, in respect for, for authority, uh, for families, for parents, um, the way people would even address one another. I saw the threats on the domestic side from the, from the uh, expansion of the federal government. On the international side, very clearly, uh, I recall the, uh, the expansion of the communist world. I mean, all, all you had to do was look at a map. And um, the defeats that we had suffered because of our own um, amb ambivalence and our own amb ambiguous foreign policy on Korea, um, on uh, then later, of course, Vietnam, where we were so ambiguous, we, you know, that was a disaster and a tragedy. But the communist world had a very clear mission. And they understood very clearly what they wanted. We felt, as young conservatives, that, that our country had to reassert and redefine its mission. But in the context of the issues we've just talked about, the threats from world communism expanding into the continent of Africa as, as the, the British Empire and the, you know, the Dutch Empire and the Portuguese Empire who had been dominant in the African continent, the Soviets were moving in with a and nobody was doing anything. Katanga, the Congo, Angola, uh, wherever. We saw those threats and we didn't think to ourselves, all right, we're going to turn things around to Maryland. That, that, that isn't how we approached it at all. It's like anything good. You, you start out one foot in front of the other. And again, I think that may reveal s uh, somewhat uh, an insight on people who are conservatives as opposed to, let's say, again, for shorthand, I'm using these labels and they're imprecise, but let's say people on the left are liberal or collectivist who view government as a solution. If there's a problem, they want to go in and sort of like take a giant eraser across the blackboard and change everything. Okay, now we're going to start with a clean slate in making man better, different, that we're going to solve all these problems. We don't think of it that way. We think of it in terms of, yes, changing maybe society as opposed to changing man's nature through using the instruments of government to change behavior. We think of it as changing society by informing, through reason, through intelligence, and that ultimately, and this is very much my own philosophy, if it's right and good, it will triumph. Winning is not everything. What is everything is, is your values, having those clearly thought out, being committed to them, and trying as best we can as humans to live up to them. We were activists. We were not reactive. The current vogue word is proactive. But basically, we, we, active, we were active on behalf of ideas and principles and beliefs. Maybe our energy level was, was stimulated and sustained by what we saw going on around us. And that was the same in the 70s. The difference was in the 70s that slowly but surely we were finally seeing uh, fruits of our, of, our, of our labors. But even if we hadn't, I'm sure there were people who had been discouraged and drift away and so on. But in my heart, I still would have known we were right. I think there was a, a reawakening at the grassroots level by individual citizens, many of whom were not even involved in the movement. I mean, that, that's not the point necessarily of a movement. Again, it's, it's to stimulate, it's to, to get a message out, to make people think. And I think they, they were thinking in the face of, of the consequences of a liberal, uh, uh, all-powerful, ever-expanding federal government, they were seeing the consequences of this intrusion in their daily lives. Taxes going up, uh, 
deficit going up, uh, no accountability, uh, traditions, uh, strictures, standards is falling by the wayside, uh, really sort of a, a social uh, upheaval. And I think people, it, they went through that as adults, let's say, seeing it in the 60s and then those same adults, people who, who owned property and had children, were raising families and so on, reacted to that. What happened to the media in the 1960s? How did, how did you personally feel about the media and how you, you were portrayed or your ideas were portrayed? Well, in the 60s, they weren't. I mean, they, they basically, uh, uh, they weren't there for us. The, uh, the, the drama and, uh, well, I shouldn't say the drama, the destruction uh, that always makes uh, great film footage was, the, uh, was on the left. I remember we had a huge struggle within YAF uh, about whether or not we should picket the federal building against selling wheat to Russia. I mean, this, as I said, the most radical thing I'd ever done if it was bleach my hair blonde. You know, I mean, we just didn't go out and picket and demonstrate. Um, we finally voted to do it. I mean, this was a principle and vow. And we, we got some press coverage and stirred up a little uh, ruckus. But basically, the action from the press's point of view uh, was on the left. Now, I hasten to add, I suspect part of that was because many in the press were sympathetic to what was going on. Um, I think the media uh, has, has its own sort of view and, and, and agenda, and uh, they've, never, they've never given the attention to what was really going on in the 60s, and I dare say, despite all of the attention that's been given over the last several months about revisiting Woodstock, I mean, I hope now it's you know back to nice pasture land, but is all from the point of view that these were people that, that were the dominant influence of their age, of their time. Well, they may have been the dominant influence on the media, but in terms of step-by-step step, getting some things done through the political process by being basically like good citizens and working to change society through an ordered legal process that's that's what YAF was was doing um, and, why so, and the press didn't Let's didn't pay any attention to us I think basically there is a a reverence and and an, an understanding of the uniqueness and the fragility and strength, but it is of, of our constitutional system, of the system of laws, not of men. And a lot of people on the left were, were uh, you know, basically anti that system. They, uh, you know, and they were also great showmen and, uh, you know, uh, you know, bomb throwers and, and, Torch lighters and everything else. That it, it was it. It was much more. Plus, they also had, I think, behind some of those radical student movements, there were um, organized subversives. I mean, that that does not uh, say that they all were by any means. But but I think their purpose, some of them in those organizations, was to destroy the system of government, to create um, social dysfunction to exacerbate um, natural, uh, or, or at that time, some social and racial tensions. The ideas that we articulated have been handed down, you know, through the centuries. And it, 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 it was that continuity that, that I think was important. We were not out there just as some on the left were, although there were many on the left that had very legitimate concerns. and. Uh, uh, and were very dedicated in their way. But there were a lot of them that were very destructive, that uh, wanted to see the system fall down, that you know, felt that uh, every racial problem was due to you know, whitey, it's, or you know, the white man that were exacerbating those, those tensions, playing off them, manipulating them. I mean, they were, they were interested more in, in getting the media attention and seeing things destroyed than they were working towards political uh, power, um, it, and and they played right to the media, and the media loved it. It was a great media show, showing that you know all the A. B. Hoffman and the Chicago Seven and everything else. And in fact, in the process, they wreaked havoc on the Democratic Party. That and the Democratic Party still hasn't recovered. What what changed 
for you? Where, how, what happened since? What happened to me, um, I suppose, is that those values and principles are very firmly grounded. So what I've been doing in the recent years is not necessarily rethinking, because I didn't set out to live 12 years in Washington and own my own business and do all things, but to try and open up more time so that the things that I talk about and believe in, in the abstract and also in the pragmatic, but that I, that I talk about and present to a large audience through mail, through communications, through advertising, I can now have an opportunity to do those things and, and uh, reflect those values more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. For example, working with, with uh, young people who are uh, what they call now unaccompanied refugee minors who come from Southeast Asia and Central America. People who are fleeing the, the tyranny and repression of the communist system, which I have fought along with millions of others for many, many years. Where I fought it before in an activist way, in a polemical way, in, in, in getting our message out, I'm now working and want to have more time to work with more with 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 individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And if if that's not a change so much change in the sense that I'm uh, countering what I thought I'd do before or anything like that. It's simply an it's evolving. It's evolving into my life has changed very much in that respect. Right. Did this time that you lived through and that you grew up in improve where we're at today as a country? Are we better off today? There's a there's a reason for things, and out of everything, somewhere or another, you can you find good, make it good, see the good, reflect the good, and I think that's true in the '60s. Certainly, uh, the dominant impression is one of you know the, the 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 radical left and the the counterculture, but most definitely there was a whole cadre, a whole group of people, such as such as I and others who were from a wide diverging uh, backgrounds, uh, all ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic, educational, and so on, who worked in YAF for Goldwater. Later on, work for Reagan, another generation, and uh, that that was all very, very good. We we learned more about our ideas. We learned to refine them. We could articulate them fairly well. Um, it it was a magnificent training ground, a magnificent experience, and many of the people then uh, went on. Some went on with their own lives, totally out of politics, other than you know on the national level. Uh, many of them ended up uh, in Washington, and, which is kind of odd itself. But they, many of them ended up here uh, as the movement spread, and uh, it fostered. Talking about direct mail again, that that medium helped foster the creation and proliferation of a lot of conservative single issue groups. But uh, you, you mentioned one thing about the left getting into the, the mainstream. Uh, I don't think they have an understanding where the mainstream is. That the, the party has moved so far to the left of, of Democrats like Thomas Dodd of uh, Connecticut, who was a very strong anti-communist, um, Scoop Jackson, uh, Paul Douglas, who Democrat, liberal on domestic issues, but a very strong anti-communist, very, very clear definition of what the American posture should be vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, that that battle was the defining battle intellectually, philosophically, not to mention military, the defining battle of our age. Not nuclear weapons, but that fundamental conflict. Uh, it's obviously now being resolved in our, as we thought it would, that the system would fall of its own weight. But I think they're having difficulty getting into the mainstream because they, they don't know where it is. If you've made it this far, you've watched all of Emmy, and I think it's a wonderful interview. She really does express her point of view and her philosophy I thank her for it. If you want to thank me, there's a little thing below the screen called Super Thanks. And that money that I get from Super Thanks keeps me going. So if so inclined, and if you have the resources, please consider Super Thanks. David Hoffman, documentary filmmaker, another interview. Thank you.